Okay, it says seven o'clock to me, so we will get started. Welcome everyone to Broadview's National Online Reading Club. Um, my name is Emma Prestwich and I'm Broadview's digital editor. And helping me out behind the scenes tonight is Robert Lewinag, who is Broadview's associate editor. Robert, do you want to wave? <laughs> awesome. We're so glad that you've taken an hour out of your evening to be here with us. Tonight, I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original owners and custodians of this land. Today, Toronto is home to many, including a diverse urban Indigenous community of Inuit, First Nations, and Métis. We would love to know where you're joining us from tonight, so please say hello from your hometown in the chat space. If you're part of a faith community and you want to add that as well, please do so. And if you want to add your own land acknowledgement from wherever you are, please do that as well. A few notes before we get started. Um, I want you all to know that we're recording this session so we can share this event with others. If you're uncomfortable with your thumbnail video appearing on the screen, please uh, turn off your video now. And please mute your audio during the event if you're not speaking or asking a question. And turn on the chat function. So if you haven't used Zoom before, there's a chat button at the very bottom of the screen that you can use to ask a question during the Q&A period or make a comment if you'd like at any time. And also please use speaker view instead of gallery view. Um, it allows you to see uh, who is speaking at the moment. This evening, we're gonna hear from Alison Dunning, Miguel De La Torre, Carol Moscott and Carlo Ricci, all of whom were featured or contributed to the October-November 2022 issue of Broadview. One final note before we start, uh, after our speakers have told us a bit about themselves, there will be a chance to ask questions. Robert will post some instructions on how to do so in the chat space. And I, I have some questions ready, but this is, this is your chance to ask our speakers about themselves and their stories. And we'll have a better, more vibrant conversation if there's more participation. All right, so let's get started. We're gonna start with Miguel. Miguel de la Torre is a professor of social ethics and Latinx studies at the Illiff School of Theology in Denver and the author of dozens of books. In his interview in, his, in our latest issue, he spoke about how Christians can decolonize their faith and the big gulf between Jesus' message and Eurocentric theology. Please welcome Miguel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. If you could just remind me, how long do you want me to speak for? About five minutes. About five minutes. I can definitely do that. So, so basically, I think what um, um, the interview was uh, uh, focused on was this uh, understanding that the way Christianity has been constructed in the Western Hemisphere um, really has very little to do with uh, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Um, and therefore, for those of us who are of minoritized communities in the United States, that's the area from which I am working from, um, we really need to reject this Eurocentric Christianity if we're hoping for any form of um, uh, liberation or salvation. Uh, one of the things I mentioned is that, um, or too often, well, what I mentioned is that when the French um, had a revolution and they cried out, Libite, Igarite, and Franite, it, it was never meant for their colonized people in Algiers, in uh, Haiti, or in Vietnam. So part of the problem is that the way this Christianity developed was from the beginning meant to exclude those who were among the colonized, those who were not part of the Eurocentric center. So for me to embrace that form of Christianity um, basically makes me complicit with the oppression of my own people. One of my intellectual mentors, Jose Mati, probably said it best when he said, um, el vino de platano y si sale agrio sigue siendo nuestro vino. And for those of you who have yet learned the language of the angels, let me go ahead and translate that for you. It uh, basically says, um, we will make our wine out of plantains. And even if it comes out sour, it's still our wine. And what Mati was trying to communicate 
is that when we do our philosophy, he was a philosopher and revolutionary, uh, revolutionary leader in the, earth in the late 1800s. When we do our philosophy, when we do our thinking, uh, we have to use our own cultural symbols, not the cultural symbols of the empire, not the cultural symbols of those who wish to oppress us. And it doesn't matter if we get it wrong. It's still ours. It still belongs to us. So the work that I've been trying to do um, has been how do I understand this Christianity apart from the way it has been constructed by Eurocentrism and, and root it within my own culture, within my own traditions. Um, this is kind of um, um, a, a decolonizing way, I think, of, of trying to reclaim a faith that we um, marginalized within the United States have, have been um, uh, um, disenfranchised from. And I think that's about five minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Wanted to ask you, are there, there are so many ways in which the Christian theology is perpetuated as Eurocentric, especially for those of us in the West. Um, are there, are there, are there forces that are perpetuating it right now that are particularly notable to you? Are there, are there particular ways in which you see that sort of theology perpetuated that um, ways that are catching your attention right now? Absolutely. Well, being a professor at a theological school, I'm quite familiar with what is being taught in theological schools throughout the United States, as well as in Canada. Um, and, and it's really, um, um, theology is taught in such a way in where yours, European theologians are the ones that have the right answers. That's the truth of theology. And then those of us on the margins who do black theology or Asian American theology or, or Latinx theology, we're interesting perspectives. But obviously that's, you know, that's not a core class that should be taken. We should be instead teaching elective classes about how our communities do um, theological um, um, constructions. So, so within the academy itself, um, Eurocentric theologies is uplifted as being the correct way of doing theology, while the other ones, uh, those that are rooted in marginalized communities, are just interesting perspectives. And, and you could tell by even the way I've just described this, when I said theology, it's automatically assumed it's Eurocentric. But if I have to talk about how theological perspectives are developed within the African American community, then we call it black theology or Latinx theology or Asian American theology or indigenous theology. So we use our, our identity as an adjective um, to, to reinforce the fact that we're not in the center of the conversation. Uh, your colleague, uh, Anthony Elmkall, um, who works at ILIF as well, he wrote a piece for us about. Um, uh, that was really, uh, I was talking about John Shelby Spong, who's a late theologian that many of us are familiar with, but uh, part of, I think, um, he, he speaks about this as well, this idea that many of the theologians who many of us are familiar with in the West um, are all white. Um, mm -hmm. And just how do we move to, uh, exactly what you said, how do we move to incorporating those perspectives? It's, yeah, there's, there's a lot there. Um, there is, and, and Antonio Lomko is, 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 is definitely correct in this, and that um, even liberals who think that they are woke enough and that they get it and that they're in solidarity with, with marginalized community usually have their own form of racism and ethnic discrimination and white supremacy undergirding um, their liberalness. And I think this is one of the things that Tony Lumko uh, was trying to lift up in, in, in his writings and in his, in his books. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I, I advocate in, in, in my own writing is that for communities of color to, 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 to be saved, to use that um, evangelical term, uh, they have to crucify uh, the whiteness that has been imposed upon them. They, they have to decolonize their mind and, and base their, their understanding of the cosmos within their culture. And, and for those who are Eurocentric, 
uh, for those who are white, um, they have to learn how to bow their knees to the Black Jesus or to the Indigenous Jesus or to the uh, Latinx Jesus or to the Asian American Jesus. And that's one way of moving away from that centering of, 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 of a white Jesus. Uh, and, and just as a side note, when I say white, I'm not talking about skin pigmentation. Um, I'm talking about an ideology um, that supports white supremacy. Um, and, and, and obviously, um, there are also many people of color whose minds are so colonized that they, for all practical purposes, are white because they support this white Jesus. Ray has a question. Uh, he says, I invited an imam to our United Church to be my guest at a Christian men's breakfast. I'm advocating for our church to start the affirming process for full inclusion of gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, and non-binary persons in the church's life and ministry. In, in your eyes, do my actions make this Christian what you call a badass believer? I mean, these actions, oh, absolutely. They're very, very Christian in, in, in that number one. Um, as, as, as one who, who, who is rooted in liberation theology, one of the things that we constantly argue for is that um, orthodoxy is not what's important. Correct doctrine is not the issue. It's correct practice, orthopraxis. And, and, and it does, you know, and um, if, a, if an iman comes to a Christian setting, I would hope that Christians go to an iman setting as well, that, that, that it be reciprocal and that we can learn from each other because in effect, we, we are still, you know, all children of God. Um, and I can't imagine um, any type of embracing of the Christian message without embracing our queer siblings as well. So, so these are definitely the praxis that are required uh, to be faithful, for those who are Christian, to be faithful to what they say is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another question from, from Peter. He's wondering, which resources do you recommend for those wanting to work at decolonizing our faith? There are many scholars from the margins, many scholars of color, who have written books on, um, on, on decolonization and on um, how to really embrace um, one's faith from that perspective. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of like, for example, Tink Tinker, who's an indigenous scholar, uh, who says that for Indigenous people, they have to say no to Jesus in order to get saved. Uh, because the Christian worldview and the Indigenous worldview are just very contradictory. Now, I, I, I believe that there's something there uh, that he's saying that, that convicts me. And, and, and because of that, he's an excellent conversation partner. Kwak Pulan has written... Um, uh, uh, several books on the decolonization of Christianity and, and Asian feminism. Um, she's, a, she's another scholar that I would look at who's written on the subject. Um, Tony Penn also have written on this. He's a humanist, so he rejects all forms of theist religions, but he still is rooted in the liberationist perspective of which to do one's faith. Um, uh, Stacey Floyd Thomas, for example, is a womanist um, scholar who also wrestles with these decolonizing issues. So there was many, many scholars from many different um, um, communities uh, that are disenfranchised and disinherited who have been dealing with these topics. Um, so that's where I would begin doing my research, listening to the people from the communities themselves who are trying to understand how to reconcile faith with this, uh, with the way faith has been presented um, through Eurocentric colonization. Are there other problematic theologies that Christians need to shed? I think one of the main, one of the major problems of, and, and now I'm speaking from my own Latinx um, um, background, is, is even how the Bible is translated becomes problematic. Uh, you know, give an example, um, in, in the English, we read about being a righteous, um, and, and forgive the sexism of the Bible, but being a righteous man. The prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Um, and the word righteous um, in, in Latin come from the word um, hutitia, 
which in English was translated into righteousness, but in the Spanish and in French and in, in the Romantic languages, it was translated into justice. So when you read that passage, there's a big difference between the prayer of a righteous man availeth much and the prayer of a man who does justice availeth much. You know, um, it, it changes the entire meaning of scripture and where um, in, in, in the English, I could be righteous by myself in a deserted island by having clean thoughts and, and praying, but to do justice, you need community. And this might explain why the way your centric Christianity has been developed is so your is so individualistic, so hyper individualistic that it's about me, me getting saved, me having a personal savior, as opposed to communities of color in where our faith is rooted in the community itself. And the whole community is saved, not just an individual. So it changes the entire understanding of Christianity when done from the margins of society. Speaking of friction, you mentioned briefly in the interview some, some friction you'd experienced in a, uh, working with a church. Um, uh, which opinions of yours have caused you the most trouble with, with <laughs> other Christians? I would say a, a lot of the opinions that I have written about have caused me problems. Um, I write about um, embracing hopelessness, which, of course, within Christian circles, hope is one of the gifts of the spirit. How can we embrace hopelessness? And my argument is that the vast majority of, 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 of my community, the vast majority of, of the wretched of the earth, live in, in the Saturday um, after the crucifixion and before there's any faint understanding of a possible resurrection. And if I'm going to be in solidarity with the least of these, I have to be sitting in the dust of the Saturday, of the hopelessness of that moment. Um, and, and, and the truth is, for many individuals who are marginalized in, in the global South, they will die and never be able to, to even taste liberation or freedom. So, so it is hopeless for a lot of us. And, and, and how do we embrace this? How do we do our faith in that midst of hopelessness without some um, es um, eschatological um, happy ending um, at the end? Um, and, and the other thing that, that I know have created a lot of trouble is that I talk about, I'm an ethicist. So I've developed, um, well, I didn't develop, but, but, but I learned from the margins this ethics para joder. And again, for those who know Spanish, that word you never use in polite company because it's similar to a certain four-letter word that begins with F and ends with K. And, and this is an ethics that screws with the dominant structures. It's Jesus overturning the tables at the temple. And when neoliberalism has won, when racism and sexism and, and homophobia um, will be around way after we are long gone, um, the only ethical response is to screw with, 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 the, with the structures of power, which, again, I'm learning from communities of color. I mean, um, all communities that are marginalized have trickster images in them. So how do you do ethics using a trickster image? And, of course, this has caused um, a lot of pushback, um, you know, um, preaching against hope. And, and talking about screwing with powers of structures, it's not something that uh, personal piety is, is well reconciled with. Yeah, that's a that's a good point because I suppose the the personal, if you approach faith personally, there is that hope of the Sunday, but um, spending spending some time on the Saturday is that's definitely something for us to sit with. And that's just sometimes, sometimes your entire life. To move, not to take away from the hopelessness, but while you're calling for people to sit with that, are there, are there moments of hope? Are there, you spoke a bit about some of the, some of the writers, some of the uh, thinkers that have been really inspiring you. Um, mm -hmm. Are there people you're coming across in your work um, at ILIF, some students? Are, are, are you seeing, are you seeing ways in which this Eurocentric theology is, is beginning to be dismantled at all. 
Not really. Um, and, and I say that because those who have power are never going to give up that power unless blood flows in the street. And usually it's the blood of the oppressed that are, is the one that's flowing in the street. So the idea that we're going to hope, have hope that it's all going to work out, that somehow we're going to arrive at some beloved community and where the power is shared, it's not going to happen um, unless there's a lot of violence involved. I mean, we think of the civil rights movement. It was a nonviolent movement for African American. I mean, it was a nonviolent movement for the for, for the white oppressors, but it was very violent for the African Americans doing that movement. So to to you know for me to to think that we're moving in any way towards um, some kind of a um, detente where we're going to share power. I don't see it happening, especially in the United States with the people we've been electing uh, lately and the people who are running for office now who are not ashamed of embracing this white Christian nationalism um, that is rooted in white supremacy. So no, I'm not very hopeful at all. Um, and, and, and that's okay. Because the reason why I fight for justice is never because I think I'm going to win, because I'm not. I fight for justice because I have no other choice. It defines my faith. And more importantly, it defines my humanity. Um, you know, it's not a transactional reason that I'm going to get an extra ruby and a crown when I get to heaven. It's, I do it because it's, it's, it's what we are called to do, regardless of the outcome. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts and something good to send us away with. Um, there are a couple of comments from folks. Um, Linda says, uh, Miguel, your article touched in connection with the thoughts I've had about Eurocentric Christianity. I will look forward to reading your books. Thank you for your time and inspiration. And Thank Carolyn you. has a, um, she finds it hopeful and hopefully hopes that these ideas can come up again and again. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We're gonna move on to our next guest. Alison Dunning is the National Manager of Peer Support Canada, which certifies peer supporters to work with those who also struggle with mental health issues. Miranda Newman interviewed her in heart and soul about the value of peer support and the need to expand access. Please join me in welcoming Alison. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here and happy to uh, be speaking with you all tonight. I do encourage questions. I do a lot better with uh, some open dialogue. So please, please, please feel free to um, ask questions as I talk a little bit. But um, yeah, I think uh, it's the article was really focused on um, peer support and how valuable it is and um, and how it needs to be expanded across the country and used more than it's being used now. And it talked a lot about some of the barriers um, that are stopping peer support from being used. And I'm going to talk a lot about that, but I think, you know, one of the suggested questions um, was around uh, just sort of how we got into this field. And I think for me, it's it's both comical and relevant. So I thought I'd share that a little bit first. Um, so I've really struggled with my own mental health for my whole life, especially when I was uh, quite a bit younger. Um, I really, really struggled with a lot of depression, anxiety, and something called borderline personality disorder, if you care about diagnoses, which I have come not to, but um, I really did struggle, was in and out of hospital and seeking support uh, within a relatively broken system. Um, and then along the way, I was also trying to get a job, and um, I was pretty open with potential employers about my mental health experiences because I needed to be. Um, for me to be able to work, uh, I did need some accommodations with regards to my mental health. And so I was always pretty open and honest about it during the hiring processes. And it never really went very well, as you might imagine. Um, you know, the door was often sort of shut in my face once that sort of piece of the puzzle came up and uh, everything else about me was was just not really um, put onto the table. So um, I was struggling with that, struggling with my mental health. I took time off school and all of that and, and was looking for some volunteering positions to sort of pad my resume with anything at the point, at that point, um, and walked into this place called the Mood Disorders Association of Ontario um, and said, hey, I'm looking to volunteer. And during my conversation or interview with uh, their volunteer coordinator, I was asked like, oh, do you have any experiences with mental health challenges? And in my head, I started was like, okay, here it goes. Here comes the door. It's coming. It's coming. 
Um, and I said, yes, I do. And they said, oh, that's so great. That's exactly what we need. And I was like, what is going on? <laughs> it really threw me for a loop. Um, it was a totally, completely different reaction than anything I'd obviously experienced. And so um, I started volunteering there as a peer supporter. So what, what peer support is, is as, as, um, as we've said, is, is that we take people with lived experience, usually of mental health or substance use health challenges. We teach them how to use that lived experience to be able to support other people that are struggling. So rather than relying on uh, a certain degree or you know, a six year master's program, we sort of value the, the lived experience piece of the puzzle. Um, and encourage people to use that uh, to be able to support other people that are struggling. So, for example, with my own experiences, I would pull from my experiences of navigating this broken system and how frustrating it was. Um, I would sort of talk about the ways that I manage my own anxiety. Um, I would talk about the sort of um, uh, treatment paths that I had gone down to be able to get to a point of wellness um, and really just listen and be there and, and uh, share some space with people um, that had been through similar experiences than me um, in order to sort of support their, their wellness journey. Um, so I wholeheartedly believe in peer support. I have not backed away since the day um, that that conversation happened and have sort of um, fulfilled various positions in the peer support space, but it's a struggle. Um, and I think the article was really getting at, at those struggles that the, the field is facing in that uh, it's just not used enough and not understood enough and not embraced as much as it should be, especially given um, sort of the state of, uh, of mental health across the, around the world um, post COVID-19. So, um, you know, some of the reasons that uh, the article talked about around that are, are things like, um, honestly, like stigma and fear, right? There's a ton of fear of, of having people with lived experience to be in a position of um, service provision. There's just so much anxiety and, and um, concern about liability and all of that. Um, uh, which isn't always rooted in anything logical, but but uh, but it's there nonetheless. Um, and sort of this like um, leniency or this 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 preference towards credentials and uh, degrees and science and numbers and stats, um, as opposed to being open to trying something um, a little bit different, trying something rooted in empathy and shared experience and humanity and. Um, so there's just a lot of hesitation uh, uh, around that, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis on on a medical model, which really calls for the elimination of symptoms. Right, peer support doesn't necessarily eliminate symptoms, but it teaches folks how to live well with mental health challenges. Um, and so uh, I think too often there's this this draw towards get rid of the illness, get rid of the illness, get rid of the illness, instead of a focus on what, what might it look like for us to live well with the illness, right? Um, um, but the sort of catch-22 in the peer support, I'll just wrap it up with the sort of catch-22 in the peer support space is that in order for it to grow and in order for it to be um, uh, seen as a more, um, the the badass <laughs> the badass thing that it is I think uh, there's you know there's a push for more structure and more uh, guidelines and more consistency and more measurables um, but you know the catch twenty two there is that if you do those things then you're almost just replicating something that already exists in the system anyways right it sort of takes away from that humanness the contacts dependent conversations that can happen between two people who share mutual experiences um, and it becomes a bit more regimented and rule-based and um, um, really as I said just a replication of stuff that already exists within the system so it is a it's a uphill battle that I think the peer support world is facing but it's one that I am taking on as national manager of peer support Canada um, it, it fasc fascinates me to no end, and I'm happy to have any kind of conversation about it. Thank you so much, Allison. To cat, to just append what you were saying at the end there, that is one of the big issues that the article highlights is the need to uh, handle burnout by peer supporters, give them some more guidelines for uh, 
um, doing their work without losing that humanness, without losing that real connection that you spoke about. Are there ideas that you have for how that could happen? Yeah, I think um, the entire movement, like the entire practice of peer support is rooted in a movement called the consumer survivor movement. And so, um, you know, back in the day, uh, people that were navigating the mental health system were treated very, very terribly, as I hope we are all aware of. Um, and so, so those individuals that were treated really terribly um, sort of uh, came out of the system as survivors of the system and decided to offer support to fellow survivors of the system. And it's sort of grown from there um, as this very grassroots sort of approach. Um, but anyways, I think the solutions um, come back to uh, having people with lived experience be the ones to figure out those solutions, right? So have those individuals be the ones to tell us what they need in terms of support while they're navigating the role of the, navigating the job, tell, get them to tell us what they need in terms of training, things like that. Um, but honestly, I think also there's this assumption that somehow because we are individuals with lived experience, we need all these extra days off and all these extra supports and all these extra, extra, extra things. And, you know, a lot of the time that's not the case. I think you know, I think I, I need just as many mental health days as the next person. Um, you know, we all struggle, we all have difficulties, and we all have to be able to, to manage our own mental health. And so um, I think it's just, yeah, around having open, honest conversations about, about what do we need to be supporting our workforce and, uh, and letting the workforce contribute to that conversation instead of um, having somebody else decide that for them. Hmm. Marion has a comment slash question. She says the Victoria Brain Injury Society uses unpaid peer supporters with training by the professionals there. And she was wondering if you were aware of that. Yeah, honestly, I'm not necessarily aware of each specific peer support program across the country, but there are tons. And, and what I like about the one that, that was mentioned is the fact that it's not necessarily um, rooted specifically in the mental health and substance use space substance use health space. And that's what we're seeing more and more and more is that um, peer support is really expanding to other sort of other populations. So for instance, individuals with brain injuries or inter individuals with strokes um, or blindness and the deaf, the deaf population, all of, all of these populations sort of are drawing on this approach to be able to support uh, the communities that they're part of. It's really just around having that shared experience, right? And so um it, it really does apply to like such a wide range of the population and uh I think yeah it's not surprising to me that that exists um there's tons and tons of peer support across the country but still not enough just for the record <laughs> and still not enough support you mentioned that they're volunteers right and um uh, that's just such a clear example of you know in general there's this preference to pay for somebody with a certain degree and not value lived experience to the same extent um, and I, I think it's time for that thinking to shift because, you know, I, I, I have an undergraduate degree and a, and a postgraduate college degree, but I've learned more from navigating my mental health experiences than I ever learned mm -hmm. in university. Um, and so I think it's time that we start sort of valuing that lived experience, um, piece of the puzzle a, a little bit more than we do right now. Kathy has a comment. She says that her daughter, who has had lifelong challenges with mental health, became a peer support worker in Vancouver. And it was such a positive experience for her because it enabled her to give back to others instead of just taking help all the time. A hundred percent. And and I think the that's sorry, I didn't even get to that, but it's another amazing outcome of this type of support is that you have people that, you know, as I said, like I was you know, I, doors were just closed on me nonstop. And then all of a sudden somebody wants to use this, this baggage that I've grown up with and, and to do good and to support other people and to, to sort of pay it forward a little bit is, is that's such a good thing for, for everybody involved, you know, and also the other thing that I love about it is that it, it keeps me accountable, right? So, you know, I think if you're, and I love therapists. I love, I love psychiatrists. I love every approach to every, every type of support, but, you know, as a peer supporter, when I'm supporting people, you know, I, 
I feel personal as a peer support, I feel personal, personally accountable to whatever I'm, I'm offering as a coping strategy. If I say, oh, in order for me to manage my anxiety, I need to make sure I spend two hours outside of my house every single day. If I say that to somebody, I have to do that. I have to follow through on actually doing that myself. And so it is just such a good way for, for individuals who struggle to also keep up, keep their own sort of check on their own well-being as they're supporting other folks that are struggling as well. So um, it's hard work, like it's difficult, you know, you're you're still sort of in a support role supporting individuals' mental health. And as you can imagine, that is not an easy job to do, but um, there are some some plus sides to it that I think are worth looking at for sure. David has a question. He is wondering uh, whether or not the difference between the two approaches you mentioned at the outset is similar to that between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Um, to be completely honest, I'm struggling. Oh, I, maybe um, around sort of the medical approach to sort of um, illness elimination and versus sort of this idea of, of um, of living well with mental health. To be honest, I don't know much about the lobes of the brain, so I might struggle with this one a bit. But yeah, I think for me, it's just the concept of, um, you know, and, and it, it also depends on people's needs, right? I've been at points in my own um, sort of mental health experiences where diagnosis was really important to me, you know, and getting rid of some of the symptoms I was dealing was a priority, right? In which case, you know, I worked really closely with a psychiatrist to make sure that my medication was helping with some of those things that were coming up for me. Um, you know, but there's also aspects of my mental health that are always going to be with me. And I think that some of those day-to-day -day coping strategies and um, also just the validation you get from peer support, um, matter a lot and, and carry a lot of weight, right? Like it's just as important for me to be able to sort of have access to medication as it is for me to be able to call a friend and vent about how annoying my partner is or whatever is going on. Right. Um, so it's all sort of a piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. There's a question from Loretta. Uh, Loretta is wondering, how can the church take up these ideas? Um, mm -hmm. If a person in a leadership role in a church has a physical problem, they're provided with supports, for example, a ramp for someone in a wheelchair. But in my experience, someone with depression or anxiety are asked to go away and not have any contact with the congregation until they are fully better. and They're put on disability insurance. Yeah. 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 Um... You know, the, this is what I was speaking to a bit earlier, but peer support can exist in any community. You know what I mean? There, there's, it's not a, um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that peer support exists on a spectrum. So peer support is as sort of low barrier, easy to access as me calling a friend and complaining about something and, and as formalized as having a peer support worker paid within the emergency department of a hospital, right? So there's a huge sort of spectrum of what peer support is. Um, but the beauty of that is that it, it it applies to so many different contexts. So I see no reason why peer support should not exist within the church. Um, you know, church is a community, church is a group of people that are there to, to um, share common beliefs. Um, and there's absolutely no reason why peer support can't be a piece of that puzzle to, to offer support to anybody that's struggling with, with mental health. It really normalizes the conversation and, you know, um, I think part of the reason that that experience happens is is all about stigma and you know a ramp up up the stairs is not as stigmatizing as having a conversation about your mental health but if you introduce a peer support program into that community you know it really just gives permission to everybody to be able to um be open and honest about some of the experiences that they're having and and just um you don't have to do that alone because you're in a peer support space. You're in amongst other people that are also struggling. There's so much more to get into, so many more questions that I have. And I think there might be some other questions that folks have as well. So if you're um, if you're open to staying afterwards, uh, Miguel, if you are as well, we'll, we'll have an informal discussion time afterwards. Um, thank you so much, Allison, for sharing your experience, for sharing your expertise, and for being so gracious with our questions. Really appreciate knowing more about the work you do. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I'll be around. Sounds good. Thank you. So we're going to move from Broadview contributors uh, to Broadview staff.
um, some more behind the scenes um, stories about how the magazine is put together. So we'd like to welcome Carol Moscott, who is our art director, and Carlo Ricci, who is the photographer who shot our beautiful October November cover, which you can see on what is it? My my right, my right and your right. Um, yes, thank you both so much for being here. Um, Carol, in her role as art director, leads every aspect of the magazine's overall visual style layout and graphic design, including its brand identity and logo. And Carlo Ricci is an advertising and editorial photographer. He shot our October November cover featuring United Church moderator Carmen Lansdowne, as well as the interior photo of Carmen in the profile about her. Thank you both so much for being here. Pleasure. Thank you. And I want to say hi to Carlo because it's the first time he and I are seeing one another. <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice so to welcome. virtually meet you. Likewise, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit about uh, cover process, especially for this particular issue, and then I'm going to hand the reins over to Carlo, who's going to talk as well. Um, we we plan our covers about a month in advance. Um, we do eight covers a year, and we generally put our most important story of the issue on the cover. Um, for the October, November, uh, issue, we were excited to use the cover as a billboard to announce Carmen Lansdowne being elected as the new moderator, the leader of the United Church of Canada. Um, I have our editors write our cover lines prior to deciding on the visual approach to each cover. And for me, cover lines help me frame what and why we're putting a subject on the cover. Um, there's usually a story I can read to get a better sense of the flavor and the visual direction the cover should have. But in this case, um, the cover would have to be designed before, uh, photographed and designed before um, Carmen was interviewed for the story, just a scheduling you know, glitch. Um, the cover line that I was given was, the new leader of the United Church of Canada is Carmen Lansdowne. Pretty straight up stuff, right? Um, once I've got the words, which I got, um, then I look deeply at the wording and what that statement evokes as an emotion that I'd like our readers to feel. What's the tone of those words? Um, that cover line as a statement is pretty in your face. It's bold, it's straight up, it's a statement. Um, and I think what kind of photograph would reflect that statement? What kind of expression should Carmen have? How should she be lit? How should the lighting work to, um, to complement that statement? Should she be photographed at a church? Outdoors, in her house, sitting, standing? There are a lot of questions that I ask myself. Um, and with this particular cover, I dug deeper. Um, Carmen is the first, capital letters, Indigenous woman to lead the United Church of Canada. This was an important cover. We had to get a sense of who Carmen um, is by the only thing she could provide, her face, um, her expression, her eyes. Um, uh, I'm going to share my screen and just start talking over some of the um, work that I do as I begin to visualize the cover process for me and for many art directors is an iterative process, iterative, 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 in that we do many, many, many versions. We start with a direction and they evolve over and over. I can design 20, 30 covers um, as the idea evolves. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. And ex excuse all the bits on the outside of my screen, but if you could just focus on what you see on the inside of my screen, that would be great. Um, so this is not Carmen. <laughs> um, I typically mock up my covers to show the editors the type of photography I think would make a good cover. Um, I also play with fonts because they're, they're another layer in conveying the emotions connected to an image. 
Um, this person is um, a woman named Nadia Kaubenz. She is an Indigenous um, activist and photographer who lives in Toronto. She did not, I don't believe she took this self-portrait of herself. But what I loved about this image was the strength, the directness, the intensity, the pride. Nadia's gaze um, said so much um, to me. Um, and I thought of this image a lot as the expression of um, the emotion I was looking for. All right, I'm going to just shift down to the next uh, image. Um, so here are my some of my early mock-ups. I was playing with a handwritten font at first. This is another image I found of a strong Indigenous woman who had a forthright gaze. I don't know who she is, but I loved her, um, how the, how her face um, communicated, communicated so directly to us. Um, and um, I, I, I liked my mock-up, but I felt the type was a little too whimsical. So I decided to try a bolder typographic approach. Um, which which um, played down the headline, the new leader of the United Church of Canada is Carmen Lansdowne. I wanted something bold and, you know, to welcome um, people, to connect people to this new person who was there, going to be their leader. And with this bolder typographical approach, with this bold face looking directly at us, um, I like the idea of transparency as a metaphor for someone who is coming to the forefront to lead. Well, now to find my photographer. My photo editor, Renit Novak, sent me the online portfolio of Carlo Ricci. Carlo is a master, a master of portrait photography. I can't gush enough because he's so wonderful. And there is a warmth and boldness to his work that I love. Carlo and I had a brief conversation. Um, my, my verbal brief to him was, I'm looking for images um, you to capture uh, Carmen smiling and serious, um, like these cover mock-ups and pull back enough to see her shoulders and above her head with some background. That's all I told Carlo because from Carlo's shooting, the way he shoots people, I knew that he was gonna get this. <laughs> he was gonna do an incredible job. Um, I'd like to hand this, hand it over to Carlo. I'm just gonna stop share, sharing right now. And just, Carlo, can you talk about your experience of shooting this cover and meeting Carmen and how you work with, with someone like me as an art director to take a kind of direction and know how to take the reins and make that and, and sit with a person and shoot their portrait? Uh, I'll try, Carol. Like you, you're putting me in a very tight spot, and I told you even <laughs> before. This this has been like the easiest, smoothest shoot of my career, and so it's you know I, I'm really struggling to find some you know some juice to put something like you know <laughs> original to say. But uh, um, well, first of all, um, thank you for your uh, kind words, but also thank you because um, it doesn't happen all the time, but. You, you really called me for something that I that I love doing and I think I do pretty well. Like I I love doing this close ups. It's something that I've been doing for years now. And uh and, and so you know like you, you send me the cover and I look at it and you're already like yeah yeah that's that's what I like to do. And and I think um I think in this particular um type of portrait it's very easy to um try to do too much with the lighting and try to draw too much attention to hey look what I can do with all this you know like complicating setups and I I, I think it's I prefer to strip back and and be very very subtle very subdued like you're you're not you're not there so the person who's looking at the photograph is you know it's staring at somebody's eyes almost like you're in person 
with with a little bit of drama, you know, and something that draw the attention to their eyes and and lets also obviously the beautiful artwork shine and and reads well. But I think like lessons more in in this kind of scenarios. And regarding like shooting Carmen specifically, like she's she's absolute pro. Obviously, you know, in her role and what she does, she's very used to be you know, speaking publicly in front of the camera. She has a commanding presence. She has penetrating gaze. She's just, she's just there, perfect, taking direction. As I said, like, very easy, very straightforward. We, we got it very quickly. Uh, the, yeah, the only thing that I, that we realized our way through it, that she had these beautiful earrings that I thought just nailed it even a little more and communicating even a little more background uh, and so we showcased that and and that was it yeah fantastic um i'm going to show how these covers developed a little bit further um so carlo sent me 34 portraits and of course as an art director i was completely entranced by every single one and had to try each one of them um, I'm going to take you through some of these portraits. And they've there, there's a variety. Here you see Carmen smiling, looking at the directly at the camera. You see one of her earrings showing. And you'll see how the lighting changes. We back out a little bit. Carmen's smiling much more broadly. And I look at each one of these images as a potential cover. A bit more serious now bit more, um, you know, uh, eyes focused on the, the camera. And then I saw this image and it completely grabbed me. Um, her hair was tucked behind her ears. Her face was so serene, so calm, so confident. And her eyes looked directly at us. Um, the image is life size on the cover. And I said, this is the image. Um, the lighting was perfect. You see every pore on Carmen's face. Now it was time to take the image and play with typography. There was a variation on that image, but here we go. So I took some of the other images just to test them out and see if the type worked too whimsical. And this is why I, con I continue playing. Serious version, still too whimsical with the typography, too far away. We're not, we're losing this connection with Carmen by the typography taking over. And then I started to just rip the cover idea apart and play with all types of variations. And I just take idea after idea, typographic idea after typographic idea, and I move the type around to see what will work um, uh, to, you know, as, as, as an overall approach and more. And I thought, go back to your original Carol, the way forward, this directness. And I started to play with that. And there it is, the way forward. Still not working, still not strong until I moved the type underneath Carmen's chin. And I went back to that more serious image and things started to gel for me right, right, right away. But the way forward was, um, was uh, not a headline that the editors had asked me to use and art directors frequently um, take advantage of this <laughs> because we're not necessarily looking to change the content or the cover lines, but we're looking for a construct a typographic construct that will marry the image with the idea. Um, there could have been any three words that replace the way forward. Um, I sit with my editors and my circulation director and I show them, I send these, these covers to them quite constantly. Um, and um, at, at this point, we decided to change it up, you know, and you see in the left-hand corner, Carmen Lansdowne, the first indigenous woman to lead the United Church talks reconciliation. And you see, we haven't quite figured this out. The way forward was the, the words that were there originally. And then it started to happen. I changed the typeface to something much more 
elegant and reflective, I think, of the person that Carmen is inside. Um, the, the typography on the bottom right hand corner started to be more refined. And this is the one we finished with, where Carmen's name underscores her face, announces her presence in a bold way, connects um, her to the, to me, one of the most important parts of the cover is this line here, the first indigenous woman to lead a Canadian church talks colonialism and the way forward. And that's where it, <laughs> and that's uh, what we landed on for uh, for the cover. So thank you for listening and watching all of the variations and inner workings of an art director's brain while they design a cover. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> oh, it's so illuminating. Um, thank you so much to both of you. It came together so beautifully on the cover, and I'm sure we can all agree that it turned out wonderfully. I uh, have a question for Carlo from Monica and Dio. Uh, they're wondering, what are you saying to Carmen to get those different facial reactions? Mm, good question. Um, I think this was quite um, just instructions. Uh, it, it doesn't always go that way sometimes. Like, I, I'm I'm pretty instructional in the sense that I guide usually the subject quite a lot, but it always depends. It depends what you're trying to get. If you're trying to get something that, you know, it wants to feel spontaneous and laughing and lifestyle and, you know, and I don't know, like friendly, then you use all the tools and you just try to make them laugh. And you, you, I don't know. And it always depends, like, especially with real people that are not, uh, you know, professional talent. It's the, every time it's just a little, you need to build a little relationship but with her it was all like your business like not in a bad way she wasn't like angry or like she was uh, honestly like a lovely lovely person uh but also a pro she's done it before and she just took directions perfectly she knew how to look so i just had to just had to tell her okay let's just focus on something a little more serious uh i will just redirect her chin position especially in you know when it's so tight it's any little asymmetry starts to look weird so you need to kind of keep you know the the composure of her face yeah hope this helps thank you absolutely carol i might be putting you on the spot here do you have a favorite cover of carmen's or no just... of, of broadviews oh yeah you're definitely putting me on the spot <laughs> I love la, la, I don't, la, 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 I don't la, like all my co my covers equally, but there are definitely <laughs> you know, lots that that I I'm, I'm quite fond of. They all turn out so wonderfully. Um, both Ray and Carolyn say they loved learning about the about the background of how it comes together. Ray says, "I will now have a new appreciation of the cover and just how much work goes into delivering a final product." So thank you both so much. And thank you to all of you for being here. Um, especially thank you to Miguel, Allison, Carol, and Carlo who volunteered their time to make this event possible. After this event is over, uh, I invite those of you who are interested to stay on this call for an informal discussion time. I know there are a few more questions. Tomorrow we'll be sending you a short survey by email so you can share with us your thoughts about this event. Broadview's Online Reading Club is a free event, but it costs us 25, $2,700 per year for a Zoom plan that can handle a group event of this size. If you're already a Broadview donor, thank you. Your donations help Broadview continue to feature exceptional people like Miguel and Allison and hire fantastic photographers like Carlo. If you're not a donor, please consider making a small donation for tonight's event. Robert will post a link for donations in the chat and will also include a link with tomorrow's survey. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. Be well, and we hope to see you back again here in December when we'll be talking about the December issue. Good night, everyone.
Okay. So of those of you who are still here with us, I know there were a few questions that folks still had. Um, I think Miguel and Allison are still here. Um, so folks have questions for them. We're just gonna kind of open up the floor. If you wanna go ahead and ask. Allison, Marnie had a comment. Um, he was wondering how many Canadians are aware of the power that organizations like the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario and other similar organizations in other provinces have over therapists who retire. Therapists can't even do therapy part time. A lot of really great therapists can't even volunteer services yet. So there is a need in our communities. Um, I, I didn't know much about that. Is that something that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, there's there's tons of different approaches all across the country, but never, never enough. I mean, we all know like our mental health system in Canada is is not sufficient. Um, uh, and especially since COVID-19. So I love that there's like this plethora of of approaches. I am a big supporter of all of them because I'm a big believer in, in mental wellness for Canadians. But um, uh and I, and I honestly think that there needs to be variety, right? As I said, there's been times where I've needed some pretty intensive mental health supports. And there's other times where, um, you know, like an, an anonymous warm line or chat service or something like that is, 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 um, is the most helpful thing for me in that moment. But um, yeah, and, and in terms like these, the peer support's becoming a bit more known. And so these other approaches are, are picking up on peer support being a thing. Um, which is great, but again, it, it's um, there's a lot of buy-in from within the mental health community, but we need buy-in from our funders, so from government and um, other private funders that have the means to support uh, these endeavors. We need we need those people to sort of clue in to the fact that this thing actually works and that it's a real it's a real profession. Absolutely. Ray has a question. He's wondering exactly how big an increase have you seen uh, for peer support post COVID? Ray, can you, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Do you wanna pop in and explain an, an increase in need for peer support or funding or? Well, the, the, the number of people, like I, uh, I hear a lot of stories about, um, you know things that happened during COVID years where families had to stay home some women were living with abusive husbands and where they only had to deal with it a few hours a day now they're dealing it dealing with it 24 7. teenagers same thing they they didn't have the opportunity to to uh, socialize with their with their friends at school and i'm just wondering how big an increase uh, allison has seen in requests for peer support uh, that's yeah. a good question. It's such a good question. And sadly, it's hard to answer because there's just the infrastructure of, of peer support is, is to be honest, fairly disorganized at this point. And so, so it's a hard question to answer, which is sad. But um, a lot of peer support takes place in community organizations, right? So um, uh, there's, you know, um, uh, Canadian Mental Health Association branches all across the country, and a lot of peer support takes place in a in a community based organization like that. Um, and the demand that they've seen is, I, I, I'm I'm kind of making this up, but not really. I do think that this is a real thing, but they've seen at minimum a forty percent increase since COVID, and the system was already broken to begin with, right? So before COVID, this the wait times for mental health services are outrageous um you know and and just a, a mismanagement of resources everywhere so um uh it, it's bad to be honest um it, and burnout of of healthcare providers um and burnout of that that falls for mental health care providers as well so burnout for them is a real thing as well so it's it's not good i'm not going to lie <laughs> um um but uh, yeah, and I do think that peer support is a big piece of the puzzle. As there's increased demand, I do think that peer support can fill a lot of the gaps, can can help, you know, 
Um, yeah, there might be a wait list of, of six months a year for a dialectical behavioral therapy program, but the wait lists for peer support are a lot less. And so um, let's, let's, you know, pay them the wages that they need to be able to provide some basic support for people that are struggling. It just seems so straightforward to me. And it's, I lose hair every day trying to understand why I have to fight so hard for this to be supported. Peter has a question for Miguel. Um, he says, I'm part of a congregation committed to racial justice, living and working in a largely indigenous area in Northern British Columbia. I'm very interested in your reference to the trickster since it's a figure deeply important to local indigenous culture and worldview. Is it possible to hear more about this? If I unmute myself, you could hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, the trickster image really is foundational in, in, in the type of ethics that I am trying to construct. Um, so, so when I say I, I mean, I'm not inventing anything new, I'm literally going back to the cultural roots of marginalized people. Marginalized people have always turned to tricksters as a way of dealing with oppression, a way of, 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 of pushing back without getting killed in the process a way of, 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 of um, feeding their spirit without shedding their blood. Um, so within the indigenous community, you have coyote and you have spider, which are two of the trickster images. And, and, and they always play the role of making, of, of showing the oppressor for who they really are uh, by showing the, um, the, the, the shortcomings and the failures of the oppressor's uh, uh, structures and of the oppressor's rhetoric. Um, in the um, in African American community, you have bear rabbit and bear bear. Um, in the Latinx community, you have so many different tricksters, Cantinfra in Mexico, Juan Bobo in Puerto Rico, um, uh, um, Pepito in Cuba. Um, and then you have the Afro-Cuban trickster, which is El Egua, from the Orisha traditions. And, and, and all these tricks is what they have in common is that they find a way of getting back at the oppressor without um, appearing, without endangering themselves or their community. So, so I'm using this trickster image as a way of trying to figure out, you know, how do we ethically lie so that we can find out what's true how do we ethically steal so that we could feed the hungry? You know, how do we ethically disrupt so that we can create a more uh, harmonious society? Um, it, it really becomes, it moves away from, from simple right and wrong ways of which to do ethics. Um, so yeah, the, and, and quite frankly, the biblical text is full of tricksters. But you know this 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 Puritan tradition has beat it out of the biblical text. But um, you know the entire text just has one trickster after another. May I add a word there? Am I? Am I? Uh, can Go I? Go ahead, David. Heard? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that that trickster notion goes a long way back in European history too, of course, and not only there. But they, in, in the medieval courts, there was always uh, some form of joker right. uh, or trickster, uh, as we might use the term now. Uh, and their other societies have been the same. So, um, and you, you had the, that kind of person up even in Europe until uh, the, at least the 18th century. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the jester was able to say things to the king that no one would ever dare say. And that, um, that and was get away with it. And that's why they were tolerated because sometimes, including by the king, because sometimes he, in those days, it was a he, uh, learned things yeah. um, about uh, people doing stuff that uh, he otherwise wouldn't know. But so it, had, it had many, it had many purposes. <laughs> but, uh, truth to power was definitely part of it. But, but definitely something happened that Christianity moved away from these very important trickster images um, and started equating them with the satanic. Um, like Ozan El Eguar becomes the symbol of Satan um, when, when in fact it's just a trickster. 
So, so what I'm trying to do is recapture these trickster images as a way of doing ethic, uh, way of doing ethics and moral um, taking moral actions. Thank you. There's a question from Joan um, to Allison. Joan says, um, may, uh, referring to the fact that you were hired as a volunteer, she says she hopes that you're now paid for your good work. <laughs> I am. Yes. I um, honestly, I consider it's kind of sad, though, to be honest, I consider myself pretty lucky that I have been able to make a full time career out of um, peer support. It's doesn't happen all the time sadly there's um uh there's still a lot of reliance on volunteers in peer support spaces but there's also a growing understanding that we need to be paying people for their lived experience expertise so there's a lot of um folks that are are paid peer support workers working in different um organizations and i yeah, I started off as a volunteer at Mood Disorders Association of Ontario. I became their peer support coordinator, so I helped with their training and supervising the volunteers. Um, and then I was a program manager um, at another organization, and now I'm I'm the national manager at Peer Support Canada. But but again, like there needs to be more leadership opportunities provided to people with lived experience. Um, it should not just be something that's offered to me. <laughs> um, you know, there's just so much valuable expertise that comes from using that lived experience lens, and those people need to be in the decision making seats at the table. So we need more of it. But yes, I am uh, happily employed in my position now. That is good. Uh, Carolyn. Oh, I think yeah. uh, Carolyn has a question. She <laughs> yes, I was. Yes, I was just asking, um, I was a little late in getting in hearing uh, Miguel's talk and I was so disappointed because I really liked his article. It just made you think and I need, I think we all need to have a knock over a head and rethink things. And I wondered if in his class uh, is his um, uh, pe people that come to his class, is it becoming uh, more people are coming? Do you find the interest uh, growing? I, I don't need to be personal, about it, but I just think that you must have a lineup to get in there. Oh, you're on mute. I was muted there. Um, what I find interesting is, is the people who find this conversation so helpful. Um, many, well, when I start talking about hopelessness, I find that I'm talking to two different groups. One group, I have to really explain what I mean by hopelessness. I have to give a lot of examples. I have to really explain the culture where people are coming from who are hopeless. And then there's another group which are already hopeless and I have no pro they have no problem understanding what I'm saying. I mean, they immediately get it. They, you know, when, when, when I wrote, I, I wrote a book called Embracing Hopelessness, that when um, it when I was writing it, one of my, my one of my TAs was a gang member. He ended up being arrested, so he asked if he could take the manuscript to jail with him. And he started a book club, um, a book study among the other gang members who were in prison. And he said that they had no problem understanding hopelessness. I mean, they they live it, they understand it. And what was helpful was trying to figure out what do you do with that hopelessness. And as we know, people who are hopeless sometimes make very bad choices that are self-harming or harming to society. So what I'm trying to figure out is how do we um, do, do, do we channel that those real feelings of hopelessness towards something more positive, something that could actually um, bring change to society? Um, so so yes, I have many, you know many people, especially um, younger, uh, students who who relate to this a lot easier, but then I also have a lot of pushback from people who are still rooted in this idea that you know I must have hope, and if I don't have hope, I'm failing Jesus somehow, and I'm not a good Christian. Thank you, David. You had a question. Yeah, I had one for uh, Allison. I wonder whether um, you would care to be um uh, to to relate what you were saying to the dementia dimension mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. It's funny you would ask that. I, um, I also used to work with seniors. Um, it's a long story, but, but I, I used to do a lot of work with seniors and I, um, uh, dementia is fairly specific, but there's, there's no question to me, you know, peer support works really well with folks that are feeling very isolated and very alone in their experiences. And, um, that was something that I saw rampant within, I worked in a lot of long-term care and, and retirement homes. And so to be honest, my, I've, I always sort of envisioned, uh, combining those two worlds and, and starting up a peer support program amongst sort of senior populations. But um, uh, just because I, I think it would it would help a lot. Um, but in terms of dementia, I, I don't like there's no reason. Again, I have I have the utmost belief that peer support can work in pretty much any population, any community where, you know, you have people with shared experiences supporting each other. I just I just don't understand why it it wouldn't work within um, the dementia community. Mm -hmm. um, there'd be its own unique challenges, there's no question, mm -hmm. but uh, there's unique challenges mm -hmm. in every setting that you try to do peer support in. So um, it's surmountable. Um, right now I'm supporting a, a peer support program uh, out of CAMH, so the Center for Addiction and Mental Health um, within a group of autistic individuals. So, you know, the... Um, yeah, there, there's no limit to, to where peer support can support, but I don't have personal experience or knowledge of, of peer support in the dementia space just yet, but I'll let you know when I hear about it, because it'll happen. <laughs> Allison, I was going to ask, I know you'd want to maintain folks' privacy, but can you share any examples where you really felt like you made a difference as a peer supporter? Yeah. Um, I can, and if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll share, of course, with anonymity in mind, but I'll share a recent thing. I, I also support a program out of Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Um, and they're, they have um, a team of three young adult peer support workers that work in the emergency department there. Um, so when young adults come in with mental health crises uh, to hospital, uh, they're there and they're supported partially by peer support workers there just to sort of validate that this is terrifying and a stressful experience and overwhelming um, and to sort of support them on their transition out of eMERGE and either into an inpatient unit or um, back out into the community and they do some follow up support and stuff like that as well. So. Um, really great program, but uh, one of the peer support workers there um, had experiences with substance use uh, challenges themselves, and and a patient came in um, and uh, disclosed that they uh, were struggling with substance use challenges, um, but that's not why they had come to hospital. They had come to hospital because of stomach pain or something like that, um, and they, uh, they were scared to tell the doctor, but uh, they were talking to the peer support worker. The peer support worker explained, yeah, I have, you know, my own peer, my own substance use health experiences. Um, and because the peer support worker said that, the patient decided to share the fact that they were living at a, like a halfway house. So a, a sober living facility um, uh, where they weren't allowed to be taking um, certain kinds of medications and things like that because it was a, a sober living uh, facility. And so the peer support worker talked to the patient about that and said, you know, like, I'm so glad you told me this. Thank you so much for trusting me with this information. You, you know, there is a chance that you're going to receive a prescription from your doctor because of this stomach pain. And we really don't want to jeopardize your living situation. Is this some information that we could tell the doctor together so that we can sort of support you the best we can and make sure that you don't lose access to your um, living situation? And so they were able to have a conversation with the doctor um, and the doctor prescribed something different instead to make sure that they could still go back to their sober living facility. So it's just like I really like that example because it just it shows how peer support can work in combination with these other approaches you know, that person never would have shared that with the doctor because, you know, sadly, stigma is a real thing. And, and there's some real barriers to being able to, to tell, 
you know, a dude in a white coat, uh, some of these, these experiences, right? But when you are put in front of somebody else who's open and honest and says, listen, like, I've dealt with this, I get it, I've been there. Um, it just like breaks down so many walls and, and, uh, helps people to be able to feel more comfortable sharing some of this stuff that like it, that, that really had a big impact on this person's trajectory, right? They were able to stay sober, go back to their comfortable living situation that they were, they were in and stay on their path to recovery because of that one conversation with that peer support worker. So there's like 10 million examples like that, where, you know, just just the openness and honesty and vulnerability of shared experience um, can really help to to make a difference. I I could go on for hours. I'm obsessed with peer support. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, you were the right person to be talking about this with us. Uh, Gail has a question for Miguel. Uh, Gail's wondering if you can give an example of a biblical trickster. It's it, well, the Bible is full of biblical tricks. As you have um, Jacob, who ends up with two wives, not knowing that, that that the one in his bed is not the one that he wanted to marry. You have his father-in-law, Lakin, who, uh, who who switches the um, the she, uh, the sheep on him all the time, so that he could get more work out of him. You have Tamar, the uh, who plays the prostitute to have Judah do. You know, she's a woman that had no power, but. She plays the prostitute so that Judah does what is correct and what is honorable. King David plays a mad person before the king to in, in order to save his skin. You have, um, and then, then I, I would say you have the, the two most important tricksters of the biblical text. Um, I don't see Satan as the personification of evil. I see Satan as a trickster, especially in the book of Job, in where, you know, he's used so that, um, Job can better understand who God is, and you could even say that uh, Jesus did not un did not begin his ministry until Satan tempted him in the desert, which is what tricksters always do. They they tempt people so that the person could either fall into temptation or they could learn from the temptation, which is what Jesus did. And then, if you really want to get heretical, you could say that Jesus was the ultimate trickster. Um, every time a Pharisee would add, give him a question, he would answer it in a, in, in a trickster type fashion. Um, so, so the biblical text from the beginning to the end is one trickster after another after another, which we have lost um, in, you know, um, with, with, with the imposition of a personal piety type of reading of the biblical text. Hmm. Satan as a trickster. There's uh there's a lot here. <laughs> That's... Um, I, my colleague, a historian, Albert Hernandez, and I wrote a book called um, The Quest for the Historical Satan that basically um, deals with how Satan has been imagined uh, throughout history, but more importantly, how in reality, Satan is just a trickster. So, that, you know, we, we go into that in a lot more detail in that particular book. Oh, I love that. It's great. Unless there are other questions from folks, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you all so much for being here. Have Thank a wonderful you for having us. Thank you so much, everybody. Adios. Have a wonderful night. Adios. <laughs>